What is up my gamers and welcome back to another episode of BowMaths. The last many lessons we've been talking all about different properties of numbers and kind of what are the inner pieces, the inner machinations of numbers and how we can use that for a lot of different things in math. We covered a lot of different things so I hope you've gone back and reviewed them and prepared for this because today we are doing a little test, a little checkpoint, maybe even a midterm you might want to call it where I'm going to be testing your metal on all these concepts we did. So if you aren't feeling great about it yet, go back and do some review before trying these out yourself because this is a good way to test your abilities. So as always, try the problems before I get into the explanations of them because I'm going to be doing that in this video. It's always really easy to just watch someone do the problems, but it's a whole nother ball game to actually do them yourself. So make sure you're always trying the problems yourself. So here they are, give them a shot, and without further ado, let's get into it. Alrighty, question number one. Suppose that number one is divisible by number two. Are the following statements true or false? And we have two different statements here. So these are general statements about numbers because we're not given what the numbers are. We just have number one is divisible by number two. And we want to see if the following are true or false. So it's just an example of a number being divisible by another number. We could say eight is divisible by four, right? So in this case, eight would be number one and number two would be four. And to be divisible, that means that we could do 8 divided by 4, and we would be getting a whole number out of it, right? There's no decimal or remainder left over. That's what it means to be divisible by something. So if 8 is divisible by 4, then in part A, when it says number 1 is divisible by number 2, if we looked at our specific example here, that would be saying 8 is a multiple of 4. And is that true? Well, yes, it's true, because if we take multiple 4s, right, 4 times 2, that gives us 8. Right, so since 4 times 2 is 8, that means 8 is a multiple of 4. So we would expect that part A will be true, that if number 1 is divisible by number 2, then it is also a multiple of number 2. Alright, and let's look at part B. Number 1 is a factor of number 2. So that would be like saying 8 is a factor of 4. But is 8 a factor of 4? No, to be a factor means that 8 has to multiply some whole number to give us 4, but that's not the case, right? So this is a false statement, but 4 is a factor of 8. Not 8 is a factor of 4, so they actually have it backwards here. So it is a false statement, and if we wanted to make it true, we would have to say that number 2 is a factor of number 1, not the other way around. So this was just to kind of test um, your ability to understand kind of how divisibility, multiples, and factors all work together. And this was from video 9. So if you weren't sure about that, go back and watch video 9, and you can hopefully understand how this question works from that. Let's go on to number 2. All right, so number 2 says list all the factors of the following numbers by using the method requested. So we have two different methods over these three different parts. We have without using prime factorization, and then we have using prime factorization. So in two different parts of the series, we covered how to do each of those methods. So let's start with the first one. So part A says factors of 36. So the first way we looked at finding factors was we just kind of listed all the pairs that would multiply to 36, and we did so by kind of starting with them going in ascending order, and that allowed us to cover all of them. So if we had 1, 1 in, and itself is always a factor of a number, so 1 and 36 will be a factor pair of 36. And then 36 is even, so we know 2 will go in there. And if you do some um, thinking or maybe some guessing and checking, you'll see that 2 and 18 give us 36. And then we could go to 3. So this is now getting into uh, the times tables, which you hopefully have memorized. 3 times 12 is 36. And then what about 4? Does 4 go into 36? Yep, 4 times 9 is 36. And what about 5? Well, 5 is not going to go into 36, since we'll have 30 as a multiple of 5, then 35, then 40, so we skip over 36, so 5 won't work. And then we could go to 6, 6 will be a part of 36, so we'll have 6 times 6, right? And now we know we can stop because this goes in ascending order, this goes in descending order, so now that we've kind of reached 6 and 6 in both of them, we know that we have every single factor pair. So that was the first kind of way we learned how to do um, how to find the factors of a number. And that would have been covered, especially with this ascending and descending order aspect, that was covered in video 9.5. Alright, so let us go to part B. 
and part C, which ask us to use it using prime factorization, which was a method we learned how to do a little bit later on. So we'll take 200A and we'll find its prime factorization. So we can split that up into 2 and 104. 104 can be split up into 2 and 52. 52 can be split up into 2 and 26. And 26 can be split up into 2 and 13. So these are all primes, so we know that we have completely prime factorized 200A into 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 13. So now the method that we used to find all of the factors was to just exhaustively find all of the different matchups of these prime factors. So we know that 2 and 13 by themselves are going to be factors. And then we can look at all of these 2s together. So we have 2, which we just listed. We have 2 times 2, so that means 4 is a factor of 208. 2 times 2 times 2, that's 8. So 8 is a factor of 208. And then all four of these 2s times each other, that gives us 16. So 16 is a factor of 208. And then we can start combining them with the 13. So we could consider 2 and 13. That'll be 26. We could look at 2 2s and 13. That'll be 52. We could look at 3 2s and the 13. That'll give us 104. And we could look at all four of the 2s and the 13, which will just give us 208. So this is all of the factors of the number 208. And we found them by using the prime factorizations. Oh, and actually, I did miss one. We also need the factor of 1, right? We can't get 1 with the prime factorizations because 1 isn't a prime number. But 1 is, of course, a factor of 208 as it's a factor of every single number. All right, so these are all the factors of 208. And let's use the similar method for part C. And, and if you weren't sure about this method, the video that covers this is number 13, and we'll also be using the same method for part C here. So 105, that is divisible by 5, and 21. 5 is prime, but 21 is composite. It can be split into 3 and 7. So we get 3 times 5 times 7 as the prime factorization for 105. So then to list the factors, we can start with 1, and then we'll have 3, 5 and 7, those are all individual factors, but then we can also start doing some pair-ups, so we could have 3 and 5, that's 15, so that means 15 is a factor of 105. We have 5 and 7, that's 35, so 35 is a factor of 105, and we also have 3 and 7, which is 21, so 21 is a factor of 105, and we could also do all three of them, which will just give us 105. So these are all our factors of 105. Let's move on to question three. All right, determine if the following numbers are divisible by their respective number. All right, so part A says, is 204 divisible by six? So the method to determine if a number was divisible by six was we found that we first checked if it was divisible by two and then checked if it was divisible by three. So first of all, is 204 divisible by two? Yes, because 204 is even, so that means it is divisible by 2. And what was the method for checking if it's divisible by 3? Well, you would add up all the digits and see if it's a multiple of 3. So 2 plus 0 plus 4 is 6, which is a multiple of 3. So that meant the number was divisible by 3. 204 is divisible by 3. So since it's divisible by both 2 and 3, which is a co-prime factor pair of 6, that meant it satisfied a divisibility rule for 6, so it is divisible by 6. And if you weren't sure about the reasoning for this, please go back and watch the 22nd video in the Fundamentals of Algebra series. All right, so let's look at part B. Is 981,027 divisible by 9? So the divisibility rule for 9 was you added up the digits and saw if it was a multiple of 9 or not. Really similar to the one for 3, right? So we'll do 9 plus 8 plus 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 7. So that'll be 9 plus 9, right? And then 0 plus 2 plus 7 is another 9, so we get 27. 27 is a multiple of 9, so that means our number is a multiple of 9. So therefore, 981,027 is divisible by 9. All right, so that's part B. And part C is 241 divisible by 5. Well, what was the rule to be divisible by 5? It had to end in a 0 or a 5, right? So since 241 doesn't end in a 0 or a 5, it is not divisible by 5. 
All right, perfect. So that is question three. Let's move on to number four. All right, so we got a bunch of true and false questions here. And it says true or false, and we have to justify the statement. So let's start with A. A number that's divisible by 10 cannot be divisible by 5. All right, so if the number is divisible by 10, that means it ends in a 0, right? But the divisibility rule for 5 is that it must end in a 5 or a 0. And since the number is divisible by 10 and thus ends in a 0, it must also be divisible by 5. So this is a true statement. Part B, 1 is prime. Now, for prime numbers, uh, if you recall, we basically kind of defined that 1 wasn't prime because prime numbers didn't work as well otherwise. So 1 is not prime, largely just kind of by definition. And it wasn't composite either because it couldn't be constructed by primes. So B is a false statement. And if you want to know the video we discussed that, uh, that was from 11. All right, 1,828,072 is divisible by 8. So for this one, to look if the number was divisible by 8, we learned kind of a shortcut that we only had to look at the last three digits. So if we look at the last three digits, the number is 0, 072. So we're basically just looking at 72. 72 is divisible by 8, since 8 times 9 is 72. That's just from our multiplication tables. So the whole number has to be divisible by 8. And we learned that shortcut and this method in video 22.5. So that means this is a true statement. It's divisible by 8. Question D. The main advantage of 17 cicadas coming out of the ground every 17 years is to satiate more predators. So we discussed this in video 21, which was kind of an application video. And we saw that the reason they came out every 17 years was because of the predator satiation uh, strategy, but it wasn't so that they could satiate more predators. It was so that when they satiated the predators by coming out at this 17 year period, that would essentially make it so that their life cycle would line up very infrequently with the predator's life cycle by choosing a prime number, which meant that it would be most likely co-prime to the predator's life cycle. That, that meant that they would line up very infrequently, so the predators weren't able to get used to the predator satiation technique. So the main advantage was that their predator satiation wouldn't actually end up harming them long term by the predators being able to kind of build their survival strategy around eating these cicadas. So this was false. All right, part E, a number can have multiple distinct prime factorizations. So a prime factorization of a number is when we split the number up into its prime components, kind of the atoms that make up that number. And we noted in what was called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that every number has a unique prime factorization, which means that they cannot have multiple distinct prime factorizations. So this is false because the fundamental theorem of arithmetic guarantees only one unique prime factorization. All right, and we discussed that in video number 12. All right, part F. There is only one way to construct a factor tree for a number. Now, one might think that because the fundamental of arithmetic guarantees only one unique prime factorization, but we could construct multiple different types of factor trees that just led to the same prime factorization. So for example, if I looked at 12, I could split that up into 6 and 2, and then 2 and 3, and get the prime factorization 2 times 2 times 3. But I could also split 12 up into 4 and 3, and then split the 4 up into 2 and 2, and get the exact same prime factorization, but it is still using a different tree. And so we see that this statement F here must be false then, because we can construct different trees. Uh, and here's an example proving that that statement is false. And we discussed this in uh, video 12.5. All right, and lastly, we'll look at G for problem four. The greatest common factor of two coprime numbers is their product. So two coprime numbers meant that they had no prime factors in common, which meant that their greatest common factor had to be just one since they have no other factors, right? So it's not their product. The greatest common factor is one. So this is a false statement. The GCF is always one. 
What was the product though was the lowest common multiple of two co-prime numbers. So that was discussed in video 19 of the series. All right, moving on to question five. All right, so we're asked to find the following. I made some greatest common factor and lowest common multiple problems. So part A says find the greatest common factor of 14 and 35. All right, so to find this, we started by finding the prime factorizations of these numbers. So the prime factorization of 14 is two times seven, and the prime factorization of 35 was five times seven. And the greatest common factor was we took all of the common prime factors in the prime factorizations of the numbers. In this case, the common prime factor happens to be just seven. So that means the greatest common factor will be just a seven. That is the largest factor common to both 14 and 35. We discussed that in video number 14 of the series. Let's move on to part B. We're asked to find the lowest common multiple of 175. So once again, we have to find the prime factorizations of these numbers. So 100, we could split up into 4 and 25. And 4, we could split up into 2 times 2. 25, we could split up into 5 times 5. So 100 is 2 times 2 times 5 times 5. And 75, we could split that up into 3 and 25. And 25, we could split up into 5 and 5. So 75 is 3 times 5 times 5. So to find the lowest common multiple, we essentially need to make sure that all of the factors of both of these numbers are present. So we know that for 100 to be covered, we need 2 times 2 times 5 times 5. That is guaranteed because 100 has to be covered. And to cover 75, we need the 3 times 5 times 5. But we already have the 5 times 5 covered. And since we want the lowest common multiple, uh, including another 5 times 5 is unnecessary and would make the n number too big. So we don't need to worry about the 5 times 5, we can just worry about the times 3. So then multiplying all this out, we are going to get 300 is our lowest common multiple of 175. And if you'd like some more information on this method and the process, I would recommend checking out video number 16 of the series. And let's move on to part C here, where we have kind of a combination and it's of three different numbers. And we specifically discuss how to find the greatest common factor and lowest common multiple for sets of numbers that were of size greater than two, so three numbers, four numbers, and so on, in the exercise video for Fundamentals of Algebra number 16. So we're gonna start by finding the prime factorizations of all these numbers. So 12 is two times two times three. 40 is two times two times two times five. 20 is two times two times five. And you can check to make sure I did all those prime factorizations correctly. So then to find the greatest common factor of 12, 40, and 20, we just need to find what's in common for all of them. And we see that all of them have two twos in their prime factorization. So the greatest common factor will be those two twos or four. And to find the lowest common multiple of these numbers, we need to just make sure that all of the numbers of their prime factorizations are covered. So if we do 2 times 2 times 3, that covers 12. And then to get 40, we have two of the 2s covered, but we still need one more 2 in there. So I'll add in another 2. And we also need a 5. So now 40s, 3 2s, and 1 5 are covered. And then for 20, we need a two twos and a five, but we already have those two twos and a five. So this number right here will be our lowest common multiple since it covers all of these numbers, so it will indeed be a multiple of them. So multiplying this out, we get two times two times two, which is eight times three, which is 24, times five, which is going to be 120. So that means the lowest common multiple is 120. So now it just asks us to add them. So we do the greatest common factor of 12, 40, and 20 plus the lowest common multiple of 12, 40, and 20. That is going to be four, which was the greatest common factor, plus 120, which was the lowest common multiple, and that'll give us 124 as our final answer. So that was question five. Let's move on to question six. Aiden has a gear with less than 19 teeth, but only he knows the exact number of teeth it has. He claims that a 19 tooth gear would be the smallest gear satisfying the following condition. His gear and the 19 tooth gear would wear each other down the most evenly. How many teeth does Aiden's gear have? 
In terms of wearing, what would be the worst amount of teeth for a gear to have if it was attached to Aiden's gear? All right, so we have two questions here, and this was discussed in video 20 of the series, if you want to go back and look at that. But we kind of talked about that in order for gears to wear each other down the most evenly so they would last the longest, we wanted the gears to have a co-prime amount of teeth to each other. That meant that if there was a defect on one of the teeth here, that it wouldn't just be wearing down the same multiple spots every time, but it would be wear, guaranteed to wear down each spot every single time because the greatest common factor of two co-primes is always one. That means that it would always visit every single spot on the other gear. So that meant it would wear down the gear more evenly instead of just wearing down one segment of the gear. Um, but essentially we're looking for two co-prime gears. And he says that his gear has less than 19 teeth and that his gear and the 19 tooth gear would wear each other down evenly. That means that they're going to be co-prime to each other. So we're looking for a number that's co-prime and that's smaller than 19. But the key is, and, and there's several numbers that do that, right? Like 2 is co-prime to 19, 3 is co-prime to 19, 4 is co-prime to 19. In fact, every single number under 19 will be co-prime to 19 because 19 is prime. And if it's, and primes are always going to be co-prime with every number smaller than it, which we've also discussed about when we've talked about co-primes. So we know it's going to be, it could be any number smaller than 19, but the key part here is it says that 19 is the smallest gear that would be co-prime to Aiden's gear. If Aiden's gear was 3, then the smallest co-prime gear to that would be 4, since 3 and 4 are co-prime to each other. We saw in the exercise video for the co-prime lecture that any two adjacent numbers were always co-prime with each other, so the smallest co-prime number to 3 would be 4. Similarly, if Aiden's gear had 6 teeth, then the smallest gear that would wear it down most evenly would be 7, since 6 and 7 are co-prime to each other. Yes, 11 would work, but it's not the smallest one, right? So if this question is saying that 19 is the smallest gear that would wear down Aiden's gear, then we know that Aiden's gear has to have 18 teeth, since the smallest number bigger than 18 that's co-prime to 18 is just 19, right? Two numbers that are adjacent to each other are always co-prime. So that means Aiden's gear has to have 18 teeth. And then it says, in terms of wearing, what would be the worst amount of teeth for a gear to have if it was attached to Aiden's gear? The reason that co-primes are good to have is because their greatest common factor is one. That means that if we have a defective tooth, it'll visit every single other spot on the other gear, which will wear it down more evenly. However, if the other gear had 18 teeth, then we're, we'd be putting basically 18 on 18. That means one tooth would visit the same spot every single time these gears rotate around because their greatest common factor is 18. So basically it would be hitting the 18th spot every time. And because of that, uh, it would wear down the gear a lot faster. So in terms of gear wearing, the worst amount of teeth for a gear to have if it was attached to Aiden's gear would also have 18 teeth because 18 and 18 would mean that we would be just wearing the same spot down over and over and over again. So the worst gear would also have 18 teeth. All right, let's go on to question seven. I have a piece of sheet metal that's 300 inches by 120 inches. What's the biggest possible size of squares I can cut from the sheet metal such that I don't waste any sheet metal? So the way we discussed how to do this was we had a rectangle and this is 300 inches by 120 inches and what we did is we found the greatest common factor of 120 and 300 because what that's going to do is it's going to give us basically the greatest size that we can split these lengths into such that we're able to cut this into squares so we will find the greatest common factor of 120 and 300 by prime factorizing them so 120 has that prime factorization and 300 has this prime factorization and again, try those yourself to make sure that uh, you get the same thing as me. So then to find the greatest common factor of 120 and 300, we are going to find all the common factors in their prime factorization. So they both have two twos, they both have one three, and they both have one five. So their greatest common factor is gonna be two times two times three 
times 5. 2 times 2 is 4. 3 times 5 is 15. 4 times 15 is 60. So their greatest common factor is 60. So that means that when we are splitting up this uh, piece of sheet metal into squares, the squares are going to be 60 by 60. So each of these squares will be of length 60, right? Because we'll have 60, 120, 180, 240, 300, and 60, 120. So we see that we are using the entirety of the piece of sheet metal. We're not wasting anything. And these are the biggest possible squares that we can cut out of it. So if you want some more practice or you're not sure about um, all the reasoning behind this, then please go back and watch uh, video number 15 in the series. Moving on to number eight. I have three timers. One repeats every 20 minutes, another repeats every 12 minutes, and another repeats every hour and a half. Assuming they start at the same time, how frequently will these timers go off at the same time? So let's look at this first part. So um, in the traffic light video, as well as in the Minecraft video, we kind of talked about how things on different timers will eventually sync up with each other, and we can find that by finding their lowest common multiple. So our three times we have here are 20 minutes, 12 minutes, and then we have an hour and a half. What's an hour and a half in terms of minutes? Well, an hour is 60 minutes, and half of an hour is 30 minutes, so in total that's 90 minutes. So these are our three numbers we're working with. So we want to find the lowest common multiple of these three numbers to determine how frequently they will synchronize. So 20, that prime factorization is two times two times five. 12's prime factorization is two times two times three. And 90's prime factorization is two times three times three times five. So that means the lowest common multiple of these three numbers will be just the smallest number that covers all of their prime factorizations. So we need to have the 2, 2, and the 5 for 20. We need a, a 3 covered for 12, because we already have the two twos for 12. And we also need one more 3 in here from 90. Right, because nine, we already had a two, we already had a three, and we already had a five, so we just needed one more three in there. So now all of these numbers, their prime factorization just should be covered, so this will be our lowest common multiple. So two times two, that's four. Three times five, that's 15. And we still have this three left over. Four times 15 is 60. Still have the three left over, and 60 times three is 180. So that means every 180 minutes, or which is the same as every three hours, these timers will synchronize with each other. Now, this part here says, can we say the same thing if they don't all start at the same time? Because we saw in the first part, it said, assuming they start at the same time, how frequently will they synchronize? But if they don't start at the same time, are these necessarily going to synchronize with each other? And the answer will be no, not necessarily. And we actually saw this in the traffic lights video, we saw that all the lights had the same timing as each other, but they never really synchronized because they uh, were basically offset. They didn't all start at the exact same time, so there wasn't ever a moment where they were starting at the same time. So, for example, if we started the 20-minute timer, then that means, so at zero we start the 20-minute timer, that means every 20 minutes it'll it's going to repeat. So this will be 20. 40, 60, and so on. Every 20 minutes is going to repeat. And eventually, we're going to get to 180 minutes where it repeats. Now, if we took the 12-minute timer and we started at one minute after the 20-minute timer started, that means every 12 minutes we're going to repeat. It would be 180 minutes after we started, so we'd be repeating at 181 and we're going to see that this 12 will actually never sync up with the 20 minute timer. We'll see that this 12 minute timer is never going to sync up with the 20 minute timer because they've been offset by one. So that means that essentially the 12 minute one will never actually end up lining up with the 20 minute one. So we cannot say the same thing if they don't start at the same time. All right, you're doing great. We're almost done here. Only two questions left. Let's look at number nine. So we have make a divisibility rule for 200 and use this to test to see if the following numbers are divisible by 200 or not. 
So to make the visibility rule, we're going to need a factor pair that is co-prime with each other. And one factor pair that's co-prime with 200 is going to be 8 and 25. You can try different ones, um, but this is definitely going to be one that's co-prime with each other, right? 8's prime factorization is 2 times 2 times 2. 25's prime factorization is 5 times 5. So these are completely co-prime with each other, and they do multiply to give us 200. So we know that if a number is divisible by 8 and it's divisible by 25, it'll be divisible by 200. Another advantage to picking these numbers is that we know a divisibility rule for 8, and also in one of the practice videos we discussed a divisibility rule for 25. So we can use both of these to uh, basically check if a number is divisible by 200 or not. So let's look at part A. So we have 1200. So first of all, is 1200 divisible by 8? So divisibility rule for 8, we just look at the last three digits. 200 is divisible by 8. We actually know that because 8 times 25 is 200, right? So 200 is divisible by 8. So 1200 is divisible by 8. Okay, that's the first part of the divisibility rule done. And we need to see if it's divisible by 25. And the rule for divisible by 25 is it had to end in a 25 a 50, a 75, or two zeros. And since it ends in two zeros, it is divisible by 25. 1200 ends in two zeros, so it is divisible by 25. Since it's divisible by both eight and by 25, it is divisible by 200. And that's the rule we came up with. So we are good to go for part A. So for 440, uh, we look at the last two digits, and we see it doesn't end in a 25, 50, 75, or double zero. So that means it's not divisible by 25, which means it's not going to be divisible by 200, right? So we see here 440 has 40 as its last two digits, so it's not divisible by 25. Therefore, it's not divisible by 200. And for this last one here, 3, 3 billion, uh, it, if we look at the last three digits, it's all zeros there which means that this number is going to be divisible by 8. And if we look at the last two digits, it's a double zero, which means it's going to be divisible by 25. So the number is divisible by both 8 and 25, since it ends in that triple zero, so it's divisible by 200. All right, let's move on to the very last question. So find a number that is co-prime to 22 and has a greatest common factor of 5 with 35. All right, so for the number to be co-prime to 22, that means that we have to look at 22's prime factorization, which is 2 times 11. So to be co-prime to 22 means it can't have 2 or 11 in its prime factorization. Otherwise, that would mean it has common prime factors to 22, which is not what a co-prime number is, right? So uh, our number cannot have 2 or 11 in its prime factorization. And furthermore, it needs a greatest common factor of 5 with 35. So 35's prime factorization is 5 times 7, and having a greatest common factor of 5 means that the only common prime factors it has in its prime factorization are going to be 5. So this means essentially that our number needs to have 5 in its prime factorization, but it can't have 2, it can't have 11, and it can't have 7 in its prime factorization. Otherwise, we would be saying it's not co-prime to 22, or we would be saying that it actually has a bigger greatest common factor with 35 than just 5. So basically any number that satisfies that will be good to go. So five will work since five doesn't have two or 11 in its prime factorization and it doesn't have seven in it, but it does have five. So five would be a number that works. We could also do 15 since 15 is three times five. Again, none of these numbers, two, 11 or seven are in its prime factorization, but it does have five in there. So this number will be co-prime to 22 and it will have a greatest common factor of five with 35. So 15 works, and let's just do one more just for kicks. 65. 65 is 5 times 13. So once again, only 5 is included there. 13 is good because we don't have a 13 in any of these numbers uh, that we weren't able to use. So 65 is going to be co-prime to 22, no common factors. And it's going to have a greatest common factor of 5 with 35, since 5 is the common number in their prime factorizations. So this also works and you can try other numbers. So there you go, that's question 10 and that is the test. But I hope you found that useful. I hope you did well on the test. And if not, maybe go back and review some topics. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. And as always, good work. 
I'll see you in the next video where we start talking about fractions and we get to apply all this stuff that we've been learning. But until then, have a good one, stay groovy, and I'll see you in that next video.